he became a human tool for the Nicaraguan Literature Society, which, by the way, was, was uh, organized. The head of the Literature Society was a priest, Fernando Cardinal. The page you see in the middle on the right is an actual page from the literacy lesson. It said, the masses made the insurrection. Of course, that's exactly what they did. They looked upon the war against illiteracy literally as a war. And so you see military images. On the left, with the struggle of yesterday to commemorate the first anniversary of our revolution, and with the struggle of today, we are triumphing in literacy. We will realize the dream of Carlos Fonseca and Sandino. On the right, let us advance brigadier troops. Let us raise barricades of notebooks and blackboards. Let us make the cultural insurrection. If you knew how to read and write, you were encouraged to help someone else learn. Every factory was required to set time and place aside to teach people how to read and write. This man on the left, in his workplace, he was getting paid for an eight-hour workday. One of those hours, he was getting on the job class literacy lesson. Match boxes, beer bottle shops, I mean, they don't throw anything away. Everything, every aspect of the society that could possibly be recycled was geared in for the literacy campaign. So you literally chose your bottle of beer by the letters that you needed for your version of Nicaraguan Scrabble. The, the, the post on the left is interesting because Spanish is the smallest and the least significant of the languages. The other languages are Mestizo, English, and Sumo. The Nicaraguan, the Sandinistas made a, a large mistake in the literacy crusade, and that was to try and teach people to read and write only in Spanish. This is a mistake because while the West Coast is Spanish speaking, the East Coast is not. There's a large black population, descendants of British slaves, they speak English. There are also the indigenous groups of Mosquito, Sumo, and Rama, they all have their own language. And these groups complained that the Sandinistas were not respecting their own culture, their own traditions by trying to teach them Spanish. The Sandinistas then took the criticism and went on to produce all literacy literature in all languages, the billboards, the posters, the books. You now can go all the way through high school learning in your primary language, and if that is not Spanish, then you learn Spanish in the secondary language. So if you want to go to the university, which are only in Spanish, you will be able to do so. The illiteracy rate in Nicaragua dropped to from 56% to below 15%. Now this is at about a fourth grade level. The goal then became to every year to raise it to the fifth grade and then the sixth grade and the seventh grade till ideally sometime in the future it would be at a high school level. On the right is a continuing adult education class um, to every year advance it one more year, but you see there's a lot of kids nine and 10 years old in next to the people in their 50s and 60s because some of these kids are not going to school during the day they need to help with childcare, they need to have work to help support their family, so they're not going to school during the day. So it's still, they're making progress, but it's slow. Schools and teachers are also prime targets of the Contras. Many teachers have been murdered by them, many schools have been burnt down. I also want to compare the illiteracy rate in the United States is 20% is, um, and rising. And if you count the number of people in this country, our country, that cannot read a newspaper, that are considered functionally illiterate, the illiteracy rate in the United States jumps to 30%. I mean, that, that's a crime. That with our resources, that literacy should be so negligent, neglig neglected. And obviously, democracy, it's another reason that democracy is going to be threatened in this country if we allow people to be, remain illiterate. There was also a non-existent healthcare system unless you were very wealthy and could afford private medical care. There is still private medical care available in Nicaragua. Doctors can have a private practice, but uh, if you cannot afford it, there's also a free medical system. You don't have to pay anything at all. They also had to teach people basic sanitation techniques. Wash your hands before picking up the baby. Get rid of the trash. Deal with malaria on the right by getting rid of stagnant water. And they used images to do this. Again, people were still illiterate, so the pictures were very, very functional. On the left, our health begins with cleanliness. On the right, you have an enemy in your house. Look for it, eliminate it. The reward, health for everyone. A very graphic billboard showing a child with diarrhea can die. Take them immediately to the closest rehydration center. This is one of the highest causes of infant mortality. By the way, 
50% of all Nicaraguan children under 10 years old died because of diseases associated with malnutrition and uh, dehydration. Nestle's baby formula was big in Nicaragua, and women were told that breastfeeding caused breast cancer. And so uh, this also contributed to the high infant mortality rate because women couldn't afford to give them enough of the formula, or they didn't have the sterile facility, so the, the formula became uh, 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 tainted. So there was a major campaign to encourage and teach women how to breastfeed again. Your milk is irreplaceable and is delivered with love. This is also the only exposed breast that you will see in a public advertisement in Nicaragua because within a month of the revolution, they passed a law which prohibited sexually exploitative images of women in public advertising. I mean, privately, you'll still see it, but not on any public billboards. And if you want to know what they look like, well, I haven't seen, I got here at night, so I haven't seen if you've got those kind of the billboards that we have in LA, but it's really, you just go outside any door in LA and there'll be a half naked woman, you know, selling a bottle of beer or a car or something. And I assume you have those in Iowa too. But tell me if I'm wrong. I'll correct that. Polio was an epidemic in Nicaragua. Polio is a completely preventable disease. The vaccine was developed in the 1950s in the United States, but again, unless you have access to medical care, you, you kids aren't going to get vaccinated. So there was a, after the overthrow of Somoza, the Sandinistas put an international call for help to vaccinate the entire country. Medical teams were sent by the governments of Mexico, Cuba, Italy, France, Canada, Spain. The U.S. government refused. But volunteer medical teams from the United States did go. In fact, the photo on the right was one of those groups. They use, again, the images even if you can't read that that says we want to be healthy to vaccinate is to prevent, you would visually understand what it means to see a crutch being thrown away. So they used these posters to advertise when the vaccine would be available in your community. In 1982, they managed to completely eradicate polio. There was not one new case. So from 79 to 82, it ended. 1984, there was one new case. 1985, I believe, there were two new cases. Because of the Contra War, because of the burning down of health clinics, because of the attacks by the Contras on the medical workers, again, and there's, a, there's a, um, an outbreak, excuse me, an epidemic in Honduras, and the poor people in Honduras also don't have access to the vaccine. The, the polio, again, started slowly increasing in Nicaragua. So again, one more way that you see how the Contra War is having the effect of rolling back the advances. There are many disabled in Nicaragua, both as a result of polio and a result of the war. And so there's a high consciousness about the rights of the disabled. The poster on the left, the city also must be designed for us. In other words, wheelchair accessibility. <coughs> the center of the Nicaraguan revolution is the agrarian reform. Somoza owned personally 25% of the best agricultural land in the country. His friends owned much of the rest. So while people starved because they had no land and what was grown on the land they couldn't eat, coffee, cotton, tobacco, sugar cane, Somoza got rich by selling these things out to the United States. So this land that Somoza and his friends controlled has been given over to peasants, people who never owned a stick of dirt in their life now own their own land. I think it's an I ironic thing to mention that the Reagan administration talks about the Sandinistas as a bunch of communists, Marxists, Leninists, and yet the reality is they have created more private ownership in the last eight years than in the entire history of Nicaragua prior to them. You see they're using very primitive agricultural techniques, barely industrial revolution with the ox-drawn um, plows. There is those pipes are new irrigation system that the Sandinistas are bringing into areas. And you also notice the man in the back with a gun. He's not a soldier, he's a farmer because the next major target of the Contras are the farmers. So you've got the prime targets being the healthcare workers, the teachers, the religious workers, and the farmers. Those are the four main targets of the Contras because those are the four areas where people's lives have changed the most. If you terrorize the farmer, if you kill the farmer, the crops won't get planted or harvest, harvested, and therefore people will go hungry again. So it's very common to see an image of farming and a gun is in the poster on the right. A single army in defense and production. The war against Nicaragua is a military war. It is a political propaganda war, which is primarily directed at us in the United States. And it is an economic war. The economic war started back in 1981, as soon as Reagan got into office. 
And somebody in the administration came up with the idea, let's not send wheat to Nicaragua anymore. They can't grow it. They have become dependent upon white bread. And if they don't get their white bread, then they'll be angry with the Sandinistas, and this will lead to destabilization of the Sandinista government. We call this the Wonder Bread War. So in March of 1981, wheat was cut off to Nicaragua. However, the same week, the embargo that had been placed on the Soviet Union for sending troops into Afghanistan was lifted. So 20 million tons of U.S. wheat were sent to the Soviets, and the Nicaraguans were cut off. So it makes you wonder where the priorities are and, and who, who the enemy is seen as. The Soviets, however, did divert some of that wheat to Nicaragua, so they got U.S. wheat after all, but the Soviets got credit, not the United States. But U.S. allies, such as Canada, France, Venezuela, also sent wheat to Nicaragua because they were to help them out. But the Nicaraguans did not want to remain dependent upon foreign wheat. It can always be cut off. And so again, using the Ministry of Culture, they started the first corn festival because corn is grown everywhere. It's healthier, it's cheaper, and, but people had to be taught how to eat it again. So there were cooking contests throughout the country with cash prizes for the best use of corn. And some of the things were absolutely delicious, and that's one of the cooking contests on the left. There were also songwriting contests about corn, poetry writing contests about corn. There were plays about corn. I mean, you, you know, maybe we should bring some of those here. They were wonderful. They were absolutely wonderful. <laughs> the, the role of women has gone through major changes in the Nicaraguan Revolution. 30% um, of the armed fighting forces against the Somoza dictatorship were women. This is a very high percentage, and I understand in El Salvador and Guatemala today, the figures are comparable. Some women told me that once you fought for the liberation of your country, you don't just stop. You continue fighting for your own liberation. And other women said, yeah, you don't walk into the kitchen alone. And everybody kind of looked at her like, well, someday. You know, again, sexism is alive and well in Nicaragua as it is alive and well in the United States, as it is alive and well, I think, in every single country in the world, unfortunately. But they're making progress. The poster on the right says, in constructing the new country, we are becoming the new woman put out by the Nicaraguan Women's Association. The women who fought against Samosa are commemorated in the art, a street mural, woman throwing a Molotov cocktail. But women also fought against um, the dictatorship much earlier. They fought with Sandino. And this is one of the women from the 1920s who fought. The women in defense today are as young as this 18-year-old woman on the left who's in charge of a 1,500 all-woman battalion, or this woman in her 50s. The army, which is a professional army, is primarily men. The militia, which is volunteer, is about 50% women. And these two posters are encouraging women to join the militia, that there is no contradiction between being a mother and being in the militia. On the right, everyone to the militia, look for your center of instruction. On the left, thanks, Mom, for defending our happiness. Little hearts and flowers there. The, post, the, the slide on the left is an actual page from the English literacy text, but this was the same text in all languages. And it's quite uh, amazing. I mean, can you imagine having a you know, reading lesson like that here? I think it would be quite wonderful if we did. But it's amazing on two levels. First, talking about the exploitation of women in a school text is quite remarkable. But it doesn't say that women are now liberated. Is saying that the, liber that the revolution now makes their liberation possible. So they're being very honest in the fact that women's liberation still has a long way to go. This par is part of the consciousness raising effort on, on behalf of women's rights that occurs. If you have people talking about texts like this, read texts like this, all ages and all languages read texts like this, it's, it raises people's consciousness. This is one way of changing the situation. The other way is to eliminate any law that discriminates against women. And that's what the headline on the right proclaims. Father and mother, now given equal rights. They have a new constitution in Nicaragua, which was just passed this year. And in it, women are given complete equal rights under the law. Equal pay for equal work. Guaranteed maternity leave. They cannot lose their job because of illness. And the most remarkable part of this law, of this constitution, is that it says that in matters of domestic work, all members of a household, men and women, must equally share. Now, that's pretty controversial. Anyway, I may give that, to, I say that to high school audiences and there's this massive groan. 
Well, what does that law mean? I mean? It doesn't mean that you're going to throw somebody in jail for not washing the dishes. You know, you're not giving them a parking ticket for not washing the dishes. Sometimes I might feel like it, I confess. Sometimes I think it sounds like a good idea. But obviously, that's, that's not practical. But the fact of having that law on the books, the fact of having that law debated publicly for several years, that was a very controversial law. The fact of talking about it raises people's consciousness. Women start realizing that, hey, they have the right to expect help. In, the, in, in, in homework, and the men start realizing, uh-oh, the handwriting's on the wall. So you start seeing these changes. My first trip in 1981, I never saw a man doing childcare. Uh, back in 83, still more women than men, but I did begin to see men participating and taking care of their kids. And in 1984, I came across this mural, Sandino doing childcare. Sandino is the ultimate male role model. If Sandino can do childcare, any man should be proud to do childcare. The final section, um, which I'll try to be brief, is dealing with the church. We heard a little bit about it yesterday with um, Philip Berrigan, and it is a church divided. There is the part of the church that supports the revolution, there's the part of this church that opposes the revolution, and you see both of them very visually, very active. On the left, the part that supports the revolution with a banner welcoming the Pope in 82, with a very popular slogan, Thanks to God and the revolution. On the right, the anti sandinista church can't stand having God and the revolution in the same slogan. And so their slogan is, for us, there's only God. In other words, leave out the revolution. Uh, traditional scenes from the conservative church, a woman fulfilling her va a vow on the left by crawling on her knees. On the right is a demonstration organized by the now cardinal, um, and it was a demonstration public demonstration against the Sandinista government. Now, I, I was present at two of these, one in 81, another one in 84, and yet you, I was co constantly reading in the US press that the Sandinista government doesn't allow demonstrations which oppose them. Well, folks, I was at two of them. I've got photographs, I have interviews, so, and there were no police around to intimidate the demonstrators, so it's very different from what the US press says. During the literacy crusade, the conservative church said, don't let your kids participate. They'll be brainwashed. They won't listen to their parents anymore. They'll become communists. So the progressive church came up with billboards such as this, Jesus Christ, Jesu Cristo, I now can read your name. In other words, if you can read, you can read the Bible. So again, the struggle was going on at all levels. This is a, another image of the crucifix other than the one you see on the right because we heard yesterday liberation theology is a very powerful force in Central America. And it makes the connection between the suffering and the crucifixion of Christ with the suffering of the people. And then it connects the resurrection of Christ with the liberation of the people. The poster on the right makes the connection between the birth of Christ, the birth of a new society, the nativity and the revolution united in the birth of the new man. These are two primitivist paintings dealing with religious themes. On the left is the arrest of Christ. These are all done within the Nicaraguan context. So Pontius Pilate has the face of Anastasia Somoza. Christ is a poor, barefoot Nicaraguan peasant. The middle classes on the right, or the, right, the, the bourgeoisie, the, or the wealthier, have banners and signs that say, down with Jesus, Jesus is a communist, long live Samosa. On the right is the three Marys at the empty tomb. It's the image of the resurrection. And you have the broken chains, the broken shackles is an image of liberation, an image of resurrection. And the archangel Michael there is Carlos Fonseca. So again, they, they're interpreting it within their own immediate experience. Here's the Cardinal, Obando Bravo, who is now, he's a very vocal critic of the Sandinistas. He is now head of the commission, part of the uh, Arias peace plan, to negotiate with the, with the Contras. This is Ernesto Cardinal, the Minister of Culture, one of several priests in the Nicaraguan government. The Pope and Obando have been trying very hard to get rid of these priests because it's hard to call the Sandinistas a bunch of godless communists when you have priests in the middle of the government, but uh, they've been put under a lot of pressure, but they've still been able to stay. Um, this poster of the assassinated bishop of El Salvador, Oscar Romero, is produced in Nicaragua. It says, we want bishops like Oscar Romero. It's a direct insult to their own 
because of saying we want bishops like Romero that will fight for the people instead of the kind that we have. So this was an intentional insult. So it's amazing how much openness they have in insulting bishops. I was surprised. But they have their own martyrs as well. This young man, Gaspar Garcia Laviana, was a priest from Spain. He came to Nicaragua in the 60s to do missionary work, realized that the situation was so horrible that the only way he could help the Sandinista, I'm sorry, the, the, the Nicaraguan people achieve salvation, achieve freedom, was if he joined the armed struggle. Father Berrigan yesterday talked about Camilo Torres, who's the first priest who picked up a gun, and so did Gaspar Garcia Laviana. He was killed in 1978. He wrote a letter to the bishops, which is quoted here. And it says, the active contribution in this process is a sign of Christian solidarity with the oppressed and with those who struggle to free them. It is a connection between the just revolution and the church. The, the Sandinistas are committed to religious pluralism. They are committed to political pluralism. This is the ballot from 1984. Seven political parties participated. And this is proportional representation, in other words, each party receives representation in the government according to the percentage of votes they receive. So there are seven parties, there are seven parties represented in the government. It would be here as if you know, the Rainbow Coalition would receive a certain number of seats in Congress because they receive a certain percentage of votes. Kind of an interesting idea. You know? They're also committed to economic pluralism. Eight years after the revolution, over 50% of all land and industry are privately controlled. From right to left is a, is, a gov is a row of billboards, a government textile factory, um, conservative Christian billboard, a Kodak film billboard, which you can't get anymore because there's an embargo. Right behind the Kodak billboard is a Socialist Party billboard, not the usual row of billboards that we're used to seeing. A middle class house, you can tell because they have a TV and a stereo, they didn't understand what we found so fascinating about their wall decoration to see a poster of the Cuban revolutionary Che Guevara next to Sandino, next to the Last Supper. But in Nicaragua, this was the rule, not the exception, because there's a very popular slogan, to be a true revolutionary means to be Christian, and to be a true Christian means to be revolutionary. So this was really the, the rule that we found that we were very, uh, we learned a lot. This is the bedroom of a 16-year-old whose ambition was to be a rock musician and a priest. And so he painted, his, he, he painted his role models on his bedroom wall. This is uh, uh, U.S. Kiss and, uh, and, of course, the revolutionary fist raised Christ. This was done in 81. I went back um, last time in 84 to look up his, um, his neighbors to find out, well, was he still going to be uh, one of those two, both of those things. And they told me they weren't sure because he'd enlisted in the army. There was, uh, they weren't even sure if he was still alive. We come to the end of the mural and just about the end of the presentation. You have the overthrow of Somoza on July 19th, 1979, which is every year celebrated in an anniversary where hundreds of thousands of people, not just from Nicaragua, but from all over the world come to commemorate the victory of the Nicaraguan people. This was our group from LA. These are some of the Europeans. You see in the European banner the word presente. It means that we're present, that we're here, but it has another meaning. Whenever the Nicaraguans get together for a, a, a rally, they call out the names of their friends or their family who've been killed. And everyone yells out, presente, because the idea of resurrection, that their memory is still alive, they're still with us. And whenever anyone was killed in the war against Somoza, you have a commemoration, a memorial marker. Two brothers died together on the right. On the left, literally, are three different these are not the graves, the bodies are here. These are just memorial markers. A young woman, 17 years old, on the left. A young man of what, I can't read it from here, 23 or 24. These memorial markers can be as elaborate as a piece of sculpture with a, a portrait bust, or they can be as simple as graffiti on the wall with presente after each name. My first trip, Every memorial marker was from 1978 or 1979, the war against Samosa. Uh, back in 83, that was no longer the case. I was seeing them only a couple of months old. Not one of these young people should be dead. They're only dead because our government is waging an illegal, immoral, and undeclared war against the people of Nicaragua. And this is a war against children because 50% of the Nicaraguan population is under 15 years old. 
a child's drawing on the left of a child bringing a flower to a friend who was killed. The 15-year-old girl on the left uh, was the sole survivor of a Contra attack in 1983. She became a hero when she was visited in the hospital. Her arm was amputated. And she said, I would gladly give my other arm defending the freedom of my country. And so they call her the smile of Nicaragua. The 15-year-old girl on the right was not so fortunate. This is a photograph taken um, by a, a US nun who lives in Nicaragua during the celebration opening of the community center in a small village in, 19, in November of 1984. One month later, she was kidnapped by the Contras. She has never been heard from since. She's presumed dead. All women prisoners, no matter how young or how old, are always raped by the Contras. And of course, this is who they're up against. The Sandinistas have a very professional army, no doubt about it. Very well trained, very well equipped. But what we don't hear about is that the U.S. has spy planes that go over Nicaragua daily to report to the Contras where the Sandinista army is located so the Contras avoid them. So the Contras go to the civilian targets, as I mentioned earlier, the schools, the clinics, to attack where the army is not. So who's defending them are the civilian militias. Kids, 15-year-olds, like on the left. If you, are, if you are 15 and you have your parents' permission, you can enlist. If you are 13 and are an orphan and want to enlist, you're allowed. And of course, this is who they're up against. Time Magazine photo, U.S. trainer shows Honduran troops near the Nicaraguan border how to use anti-tank weapons. The United States has had almost continuous war games on the border of, of, of Nicaragua since the Sandinistas came to power as a way of intimidating, as a way of threatening. And hopefully, I mean, hopefully on the part of the United States trying to provoke. Uh, on the left, we remember the last time that the United States became involved in an unpopular war. It wasn't just young people thousands of miles away who were getting killed, but young people on the streets of our universities. Kent State, 1970. Jackson State, Mississippi, the same year. We had unarmed college students killed by our own National Guard. And just this past April, the first U.S. victim in Nicaragua, also murdered by the Contras, Benjamin Linder, who was working on an electrical power plant. as one of the many U.S. volunteers who've gone down to Nicaragua to help rebuild what the Contras have destroyed. Now, he was wounded in a firefight, but he wasn't killed. But his name had been on a hit list. He had seen it. He knew that. One of the surviving witnesses have testified, or actually several have testified, that he was, he was still alive but wounded. One of the Contras came over to him and shot him point blank in the head. Now, nobody can convince me that a U.S. citizen's name is going to be on a hit list and a Contra is going to assassinate him without the person who's paying the Contra's bills knowing it and giving approval. Okay. So again, if the buck stops here, the buck stops with the government of this country. For not only the assassination of Benjamin Linder, the assassination also of thousands of Nicaraguans, but also for the, the mutilation recently of uh, Brian Wilson, who had both of his legs cut off during a peaceful, nonviolent civil disobedience in San Francisco. The Sheriff's Department, the Navy, had all been warned a week ahead of time the civil disobedience was going to occur this railroad track, this day, this time. Somebody gave an order for the train to come through. So we really need to do everything we can immediately to support the peace process that's going now in Central America, to prevent any more contra aid from going down there, and to do whatever we can to stop the escalation of this war against the people of Central America. And I thank you very much.